chapters 1 and 2. Very Christmassy this week, which I know you're feeling very Christmassy at home. Uh, chapters 1 and 2, lots of early nativity stuff. So you're not behind. You haven't missed anything. We haven't read anything yet. I mean, if you read the book before, that's okay. Um, but uh, this is, uh, um, we'll start that out each, each week. And we'll actually read through the text and talk about it as we go. We'll read a chunk, talk about it, read a chunk. You bring your questions, bring your comments. Um, and that's what uh, we'll do. Make sure I have the schedule right. Yep, all that's correct. All right. Questions on the logistics of, it says 6 p.m., but 6.30 is actually when we sort of get started. Any questions? Awesome. All right, a couple of ground rules. First of all, we're going to pray. I like to pray first. Let's pray. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word in which you still speak in, uh, to our lives, that it might form us, uh, might shape us into the people we've been called and created to be. Lord, I thank you for a room full of people hungry for you, uh, for community, uh, and for the truth. May we be fed well. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, and if you don't know, there is actual food, literal. I like metaphors, but that's a literal thing from 5 to 6.30. Uh, enchiladas, tacos. There won't always be a band befitting the theme of the food. Somebody ask if we do like schnitzel next week when we have a German polka band. Don't put it past the hospitality crew, but I mean, we could do that. It'd be fun. Uh, we have a few German-speaking folks. Uh, we could pull it off. It'd be fun. Um, anyway, uh, so that's welcome. But if you can get here at 6.30, that's great. They will pack a to-go box for you if you want, uh, if you know you can't be here until 6.30. Uh, I love questions. I love conversation around text. Uh, I love people who remind me I got excited and I talked too fast, so I always reward points. It's a very uh, precise uh, system. Don't laugh at my system. Uh, it's the Jesus point system, 25... Uh, is the maximum daily allotment that I can give you. Um, but uh, it's redeemable f- for glory. And uh, I hand that out to people who say, hey, wait a second, that doesn't make sense because that probably means 10 people in the room are at least wondering that. Or, hey, that was a little fast. Could you say that again? Or I have a question of clarification. Uh, and I say these are my canaries because back in uh, mining days, they would take canaries down with them. And when the air got thin, that canary would pass out first. And they'd be like, okay, we have a problem. So I need people to just fall out or raise your hand. You raise your hand is better. Uh, but either way, to let me know, hey, the air's gotten thin, I'm not quite sure, and then we can all kind of learn some more stuff. Or if you have insights, I want to hear them. Uh, and I'll try to repeat the questions I've been practicing with my children. Uh, they ask me questions, I say, I hear you saying, and then back to them, uh, practicing all summer long uh, to be ready for this in the spring. Um, and so we'll do that. Uh, excited about that. Luke is where we are. Luke is the third gospel in order. If you go Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke is the same author as the author of Acts. So uh, somewhere along the way they stuck John as sort of like, it's like you were watching Harry Potter and then you like, you know, watched Lonesome Dove, which is fantastic, by the way. You should totally watch Lonesome Dove. And then Harry Potter 2 came out, right? So that's, that's kind of how that works, except they're about the same story, meaning John and Luke are telling the same story in very different ways. Uh, since the beginning of the church, the church has recognized that John's gospel follows a different pattern, a different structure than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the synoptic gospels. Um, Matthew and Luke uh, most likely, not everybody agrees on this, but most likely had a copy of Mark when they were doing their work. Luke explicitly mentions that he has all the resources, the first passage you'll read will say, uh, he gets all together all the resources he can find to compile an orderly history of these events. He writes it to Theophilus, which means lover of God, which could be a metaphor, but it's probably a real person who's probably paying Luke to do this. Uh, Luke wants to do it. I'm not saying that Luke was conscribed, but you know how patronage would work in the ancient world. You have an artistic rendering of things. And you need to remember something, too. In the ancient world, you're talking about literacy rates that are much lower than today. Um, Up until very recently, literacy rates were much lower than they are today, which, by the way, is the root of stained glass. You know, you go to an ancient cathedral and you see stained glass. So parents, when they came in, could be like, this is the stained glass that tells the story of Abraham, and they would tell the story. You go to the next window, and it's the story of, uh, you know, the birth of Jesus, they would tell the story. Because they didn't read. The priest might be able to read for them the text that day, or they'd hear it in liturgy, they'd run into text. But they weren't reading. So in Luke, we have both the written stuff that might have come before Luke, but also the oral tradition of the people who experienced it. Luke was not, uh, what we'd say, a disciple of Jesus. Uh, He comes on the scene in that next wave of followers of Jesus, certainly a believer um, in that next generation. Uh, Probably written uh, in the latter half of the first century, Uh, the first century, which is like 75 to 85 in that range. We love precise dates, right? July 4th, 1776. Uh, These matter deeply to us. Ancient people counted time
time in a very different way. Uh, but we can kind of date it around roughly about that because we start seeing things um, around certain times in Roman history and things like that we can mark. So about that time, uh, give or take, you know, a couple years. Uh, so you're talking, at least in its written final form, 30 years or so after the crucifixion. Are you all with me? Uh, on the timing of this. Luke is a highly educated person like Paul. Uh, you may have heard him referred to as a doctor and that's accurate if you think in terms of highly educated rather than someone who might treat your you know, knee issues or ear, teeth, wherever you have issues that you go med medicinally to be treated, uh, teeth, eyes, or whatever. That's less of what a doctor might mean in this situation, though he might have some clinical knowledge like that. But you're not, someone didn't go to medical school. They would train with somebody else who knew these things. Uh, in the ancient world, it would be a very different type of practice. Um, but if you think a doctor in terms of highly educated, you're probably on the track of, of Luke's background. Writes to a more Gentile, which is less Jewish audience than, say, Matthew does, uh, which will come up from time to time in how he uh, presents the Gospels. Um, yeah, that's probably enough preface on Luke. Uh, any questions that are bubbling up? Anybody want to volunteer to be the first canary? <laughs> yes, I give you five Jesus points just for raising your hand. They can be taken away if your question's no good, so be very careful. <laughs> I'm kidding, it can't be taken away. Their turn. Let me see if I can phrase this right. Um, is, is the first year AD, is that when Christ was born, or is that radically crucifixion? The, so zero, year zero, we, we find very few coins that say that. Um, there's none. Uh, so the marking of time uh, is based on Jesus' birth. So, and they missed by about four years. Uh, so probably about, ne you know, uh, 4 B.C., 3 B.C. is when Jesus is born. Pretty good, pretty close for considering when they made the, the adjustment. But based on when Herod dies, um, he's born at the end of one Herod's raid. The Herod, when he's crucified, is a uh, descendant of Herod the Great. Builder, by the way. Terrible dude. I mean, like, ask his family. Awful, awful, <laughs> awful guy. But made some, some of the stuff he built still there. Or had built for him, I should say. Um, Unbelievable stuff. But Herod the Great, he dies in about uh, 2 or 3 BC. So Jesus, we know, is born in his reign. And so we've missed by uh, a couple years there. So we are now 2,000 plus years since Jesus' birth. We're not quite 2,000 years since the crucifixion, if you're counting on that schedule. We should have been about 30 to 27 to 30 AD would have been the crucifixion. Jesus was about 30, 33 years old. Yeah. Yes, sir, Ms. Reed. Why the... And why this book? Why Luke and why this book? I'm going to award three questions, three points, so you have eight points. This is a, that's, about a, that's a six-point question. That's good. We'll give you six points. Six Jesus points. You can take those home. Um, why Luke? Um, well, we hadn't done a gospel, um, and there was four to choose from. Um, and, uh, you know... I like Luke. I like John a lot. Uh, Matthew and Mark are good people, too. We like them. Uh, all the book's good. Uh, I do think Luke gives a particular uh, angle on stories that uh, is kind of interesting to explore. Um, and, and Luke, you know, we, you probably come from all different traditions, but Luke's the closest thing to something that Methodists can claim, all right? So we're just going to say, I know the Baptists want John uh, because it sounds like his name. Um, but it's John the Baptizer, not John the Southern Baptist, just for the record. But, uh, and, you know, my dad's a recovering Southern Baptist, so I love you. It's all the same, Jesus. We love you. Um, it's great if you're here. And I know if it's a Methodist church, we've got a bunch of Catholics that married Baptists in here. That's just how it winds up in here. Um, so in Luke, I say it's a Methodist because stuff happens and then there's food. Just watch how much eating happens in this gospel. It is, it's ours. Uh, Methodists like to eat. So um, we also like, and I think there's a, there's a touch of, I think one of the reasons why my little, you know, Wesleyan heart gets excited about uh, this book is that there's always a touch of the social and communal impact uh, of the gospel in Luke, uh, where, where Matthew seems more concerned with uh, how Jesus fits in the fulfillment of law. And they, they all do this, but like the law, and because he's writing to a Jewish audience, uh, uh, more, at least robustly. Uh, whereas Luke's talking to Gentiles, which most of us tend to be, he speaks in terms, I think, that, that land in ways that are really helpful. There have been times in my life where John was my favorite gospel. Times I love Mark. Mark, by the way, is like the Reader's Digest, which no one reads anymore, but uh, is around like the, the really short version that's really fast and built for missionary work. It's always immediately and go. That's Mark's message. 
you need to know this, but you need to get after it. That's what Mark wants to say, which is a good thing. In certain amount. Luke is a little, obviously, longer. It's you know, almost 10 more chapters than, uh, than Mark is. Um, that's, I don't know. It's hard to go wrong picking a gospel. Uh, it's like the third grade Bibles is in two weeks, and we had to pick our favorite passage, the pastors, for them to look up. And like, I'm like, my favorite Bible passage? That's like picking your favorite kid. <laughs> which is actually pretty easy, but I don't know. I uh, it's, it's being recorded, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. Um, any other great questions? Any other questions? I got it. Yes, sir. The second book by N.T. Wright. Yeah, I'm a big fan. All right. So, uh, you, do you remember? Have you ever seen like those videos of like 14 year old girls when they met like the Backstreet Boys? So I met N.T. Wright once, um, <laughs> and it went something like that. Um, no, I, I think as far as, I mean, no commentator is perfect, I mean, but I think as far as conversation partners that are, that are really good scholarship, I mean, brilliant off the charts, he's a bishop, taught at some of the best schools in the world, uh, and these are, this is his like lay stuff, he does scholarly stuff, which is heavyweight, awesome, just well-respected stuff, it's, it's accessible, if you don't like, I get it, he has British phrases sometimes, you're like, what is that even, it's just being British, uh, I find him to be a helpful conversation partner, um, and he has these translations which are kind of fun and refreshing. You hear it in a new way. So he's not magic. He's not Jesus. You don't have to like N.T. Wright. Um, I'm a fan of his scholarship. Uh, and I find him to be both really uh, well done from an academic standpoint, but also with eyes towards what does it mean for people of faith uh, and uh, challenging in some ways. I, mean, I don't agree with him on everything, but there's a, uh, he's, he's, he's good stuff as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, and he's Anglican, right? So that's Church of England. Methodists are a revival movement within the Church of England, uh, which means we're a little more excited and generally with a little less wealth. That's generally how that goes. Um, you know, that's a joke, right? Episcopalians are Methodists who know which fork to use, right? That's, um, and Methodists are Baptists that will talk to you in the liquor stores. I mean, you know, it's just different things. Uh, everybody has their own stuff. Um, it's all the same Jesus, right? That's what we're, I mean, and we have more, we, you know, I'll just tell you, I should say this because we probably mixed audience and it is on the internet. Uh, we make jokes. I think that's fun because I make jokes to my, my siblings, but I will tell you there may have been a time in the world in which being just a little bit more right than the Presbyterians was the most important thing, but that day is long gone. That day is long gone. Uh, and I, you know, heard a few folks online kind of ch Protestants almost triumphant in this latest Catholic church scandal, and I think this helps no one, and we all ache and hurt together. Uh, the protection of uh, children, youth, and young adults, and, and vulnerable adults is all of our work and can happen anywhere. Um, and anyway, that's just my cards on the table that I think we should all be trying to row in the same direction because there are enemies of hope at work in the world, uh, numerous and well-funded. Um, and so for those who are at least uh, explicitly on the side of Jesus, Jesus would say, if they're not against you, then forget about what they're doing and do the thing you've been called to do. Uh, so that, I make jokes. So just everybody hears me right. It's all because it's all family and teasing is love in my family because we're not good at expressing ourselves um, emotionally. Uh, but that's more about me. Um, so a couple things. I want to do something that will be review for many of you and then I want to take communion. Uh, uh, Wes Taylor, our contemporary worship guy, had somebody else doing stuff for these students, so he'll be here to help lead some songs during communion. You're all invited. Uh, so we'll end with that because you haven't done any reading. But I do want to go over uh, something that will be reviewed for many of you, but I start each semester with this because it's so pivotal and crucial for how we talk about engagement of Scripture and how we think about who God is and how we think about the gospel that it's worth review. I always learn more when we talk about it. Uh, and it's not fair that three weeks from now I'm going to say, remember this, and then they won't remember that because I haven't talked about it. So, I get to go to the dry erase board. Are you excited? I know, you're all very excited. Yes. Uh, I'm told the blue is easier to see, so that's what I'm going to go with. Yes, <laughs> don't clap. When you clap, I feel like the kid on the t-ball team that strikes out every time, and then he fouls one off. I'm like, oh, he touched that one. Good, good contact, Timmy. Good contact. That's how that feels. Um, all right. Uh, so, um, these are ways to conceive of how, um, how the universe and creation works. So these are the options. So if you, this, again, you can uh, tune me out if you've heard it before, but it's worth reviewing. Option one goes like this. That is that everything, all that exists, all that ever exists, fits in a box we might call the universe. And there are trees in there. Uh, there's a river. All right, this is everybody's favorite part. I'm in the box. All right, and I always draw myself to scale. All right. Um, 
<laughs> this is the ear in the back. You see, that's me. That's my ears. Uh, I, I'm in the box. I've, I've, I've really broken my femur. Okay. Uh, <laughs> That's my femur, right? Where's the doctor? Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, all right. Excellent. Um, uh, this is uh, this is either an egg or a record, which no one listens to anymore, uh, or uh, Saturn. It's all in the box. Everything's in the box. Um, so if you are a college campus, we can go over to UTSA or Trinity or SAC, and we can find a professor that would tell you this is all that is real. The things that um, my senses can apprehend, that's touch, taste, smell, or technology that advances those systems, uh, uh, senses like telescopes. All that's real is in the box. If there's something called God, it's some abstraction of the box, meaning God's in the box too. So anything we might call sin or evil, all in the box. And so in some animistic religions, you hear things like the tree themselves are divine, right? Because everything's in the box. It's a way of conceiving of what's real. It all fits in the box. So some ancient animistic faiths, also you know, strident materialists on college campuses, or continental philosophy, if that's your flavor, right? You know, Sartre says like things like, life is a windowless, doorless room, and you're in it. That's it, by the way. You're waiting for something else, but that's the box. <laughs> All right? You hear it? Uh, and then you go, like, have a baguette or smoke a cigarette. Like, that's really your option. So, like, um, which literally he did. Uh, so uh, that's, a, that's the West. You know, a couple world wars and a holocaust will do some things to philosophy on a continent, and it has. Um, and so uh, this is the box. Some, like, you'll hear some versions of this where the box itself becomes God's body. And so, like, if you hear the term, like, panentheism, that's a version of option one in which the box itself is kind of fuzzy and divine, but really it's just a really fancy box. Everything fits in the box. The trouble with the box uh, is a number of things. One, the project of good news, if Jesus exists, he can exist only as some model of how the box might be idealized. Right? Jesus is a model for good human living. Right? So that's the best we got. I mean, there's no going anywhere else because that's all in the box. There's nowhere to go. Um, Jesus is a model for that, and, and good news is improvement of the box. Right? So that's all we can do is make the systems better uh, and clean up the box as best we can. If there's any improvement to have. You don't have to have improvement. That's your only option there. So um, the word for option one, if you want to keep a word in your head, it's contained. I could use more explicitly pejorative words, but I'm trying to be open here. Contained. You could say trapped if you want. Either one are true. You're contained in the box in option one. All right. Everybody, you may have questions on option one? Are you familiar with this philosophy? Yes. Yes, you've heard it. Okay. Good. What's that? It's the last part. Oh. <laughs> awesome. Uh, excellent. All right. Remedial. Remedial. That's right. She's, you failed the last Bible study. That's why you're here. <laughs> um, I didn't repeat either one of your questions, did I? Did I repeat the questions? No. All of you get minus two Jesus points for allowing me to do this. <laughs> How could you allow me to not repeat the questions? Uh, i got to repeat the questions. Um, he asked about why. I did repeat yours. But did I repeat yours? No, I asked about the years. I think my, my answer was robust enough that it got to the question. You're all excused, but next time. <laughs> Taking away those points. All right, option two goes this way. And I uh, can tell you, I, for a season of my life, was option one all the way. I call that undergrad. Uh, and in, at least the early part. Option two, uh, certainly uh, many parts of my life, and I, it's, a, it's a temptation to fall back into even now in my thinking. The box returns, but it's on this side of the diagram in option two. And now we have, uh, we'll make this cloud area, and we'll call this heaven. All right? All right? Or biblically, we'd say the place where God reigns, but we don't want to get into that just yet uh, and give it away. All right, so this is back to the trees are over here now. I'm still over here. You, I, I'd actually do portraits for people if you want one afterwards. Uh, we actually have this, we have a, a sheet we're going to hand out next week printed of some options of this so you can see it and have it for your own, not my drawings, other people's with actual talent. Uh, sin, evil, it's all in the box. In this one, this is the universe, material world, whatever. Uh, this is all... Um, it tends to be very negative. This gets a very negative connotation. Uh, this distance, by the way, is vast. It's far away. All right, and in heaven, uh, this is where God hangs out. He's got a crown. All right. Used to look like Gandalf, now looks like Morgan Freeman. So we're getting diversity a little bit, which is good. Um, but not optimum. I mean, still an old dude. But I mean, like, you know, we're getting somewhere with this. Uh, and so this is heaven. And then um, uh, generally populated. Um, times by uh, chubby 
diaper selling angel babies. Uh, they hang out, they play harps. You've heard about this? Oh yeah, that's where they hang out. Um, Otherwise, I don't really know what to put content here because the content was always pretty loose for me. I never really talked about this. The best selling point in option two for heaven was that it wasn't hell. And if you hear somebody trying to sell you on heaven by making you afraid to go to hell, they're probably operating out of an option two thinking. Option two isn't wrong. It's incomplete and can be misleading. Option two is not wrong, incomplete, and misleading. So this is a vast distance. So what happens is the Jesus mission in option two becomes this. Jesus is sent down, all right? He sets up some kind of booth-like system here, right? And he says, here are tickets. All right, and you buy your Jesus ticket, and then you get to go here. That's the good news, which is, oh, and if you don't, all right? The Jesus ticket's here, and then the, the, the only the, the downside, it's on the brochure, you have to die. Death gets you there, right? That's how far away this is. So in option two, bodies stop mattering. Like, bodies don't really matter. You heard people say that. Bodies don't matter. This is just, it's a rental. Uh, trees, earth, doesn't matter what we do to this because this is all going to go away, and this is where real stuff is. This is the real thing. They said there's no content here. And I confess, and I've told you, some of you this before, I remember sitting in my 11 o'clock sanctuary service growing up as a kid and hearing about, you know, this whole thing is that we're going to go to heaven forever. Do you know how long forever is? It's forever. That's right. He said it's forever. I, I mean, like a decade ago was a long time ago. Right, we think. That's nothing. That's not even a whisper when we're talking about forever. And so we get here, what are we going to do? I mean, the angel babies, they look cool for a while. By the way, angels in Scripture look nothing like this. Every time an angel in Scripture shows up, what's the first thing they say? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Nobody's afraid of this. You want to cuddle this. I don't know what angels look like, but it isn't this. That's what I know. That's all I know. Okay, it isn't that. Uh, they don't look like this. You want to cuddle this. This is like, oh, let's put it, let's take a picture and put it like in a pot. You know, like this is what we do. Um, it's far away. So the other thing I struggle with, what is it, forever? I'm like, well, if this is the option, you know, and I've been in Houston in August, so I don't want to go here. Uh, I'm down. I'm down. If this is it, if that's all the good, I'll take it. But like, what do we do there? Is it the 11 o'clock traditional service at Lakewood Methodist Church forever? It's a good service, but forever? I mean, the pews, they have cushions now. They didn't used to be pews. You know, that's like a modern invention in the last thousand years or so. They were standing around, standing. You think my sermons are long. A thousand years ago, they were standing up for the whole thing. All right, so forever. I believe in heaven, so don't get anybody despair just yet. Yeah. So you're talking about the universe. Here. Oh yeah, Saturn's still here. Yeah. Sin, evil, was it void? Is it void of good in this thought process until <clears throat> Jesus arrived? I'm probably being overly sort of uh, simplistic about it, but it, it tends to be seen as negative, right? Flesh, is, flesh becomes, uh, and all the verses around that get read through this lens so that all this material stuff is broken and no good. And by the way, some of that's true. It's just impartial if it's told in a way that says all this stuff is over here and doesn't matter. Bodies seem to matter. So here, here's where it starts to fall apart for me. So I remember, and maybe you feel this way, what does prayer look like if you're an option two person? I remember thinking, like, what am I doing? I, I, put it, I put a little note in a bottle. I throw it out in some cosmic water and hope it floats far enough that, you know, God picks it up and goes, oh, yeah, Trammell would like a little more courage. That's not happening, you know. And he throws it back in the water or whatever. Uh, that's not. That's a bad God impersonation. He's way better than that. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, that's prayer didn't make sense to me. Jesus starts to get kind of strange here. So have you ever thought, like when people talk about Jesus, he sounds like he might be mildly schizophrenic. It's probably because, and I don't mean to make light of schizophrenia. I mean, it really is. Like there's some sort of like two people going on here instead of one. Jesus, who shows up, either what happens is he really becomes just a person that belongs over here and doesn't have this stuff. So early in the, the 100s, the second century, people start talking about Jesus like he wasn't really human. He only appeared to be human. It's the first heresy of the church. Except the scripture says, really, truly, all the way human. But our notion of what human is is so negative that it's hard to buy that Jesus, who could be this incarnation of hope, uh, of heaven in the flesh, uh, could possibly be that. We struggle. So Jesus and prayer uh, become weird. Um, worship is a strange thing here. Like, what are we doing? Uh, 
communion, which we're about to do, is in a strange place. Uh, the gospel, the work of the church is to sell these tickets. And I'm all for saying yes to Jesus. I am. I am. But the biblical question isn't just if you died tonight, where would your soul go? The biblical question is, maybe you might wake up tomorrow. And what does life look like in light of what Jesus has done and called us to be? Both of those questions matter, and that's why option two is not false, but misleading. And I, have, I fall back into this sometimes, and I want to punch my ticket and go home. In fact, there's a version of this, by the way, in which there's a return flight. You come back and you watch all this burn, right? You read the Left Behind books? Kind of that way that goes, right? Uh, you come back. It's very much option two, dualistic understanding or Gnosticism with a G. If you've seen that word, secret knowledge, it was around the ancient world. It's still around today. Uh, option two. And then some churches buy into this. Who cares about what happens to trees, water, or our bodies? None of this stuff really matters. Except the Bible is full. In fact, the story starts with a tree and ends with a tree, by the way. God's sort of into trees. Um, and uh, bodies matter the whole way. Easter is super weird. Right? And option two, the Easter sermon is this. Jesus died and is now alive, and guess what? You don't have to go to hell when you die. Except no one, no one in Scripture says that in light of the Easter. It's true, but no one says it in light of Easter. They all go, what? He is resurrected. We hugged him. We touched him. The Lord is risen. What does Thomas say? I won't believe it until I see it and touch it. He doesn't want, he doesn't want, you don't want to perceive the presence of Jesus in a room. He wants corporal bodily report here. That's what Thomas wants. Uh, so Easter gets really weird. All right, that's option two. Not false, but misleading. Uh, yes, sir, Bolin. Holy Spirit, an option two. Yeah, they don't, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit a whole lot. I mean, really, that's, that's, the, that's the way we deal with it. I mean, we don't, and I, you don't think, because like, uh, you know, what's the, what's the spiritual thing hanging out with us? Or, and there's versions of this option too that will say, well, the Holy Spirit used to do stuff, right? But that was an age of the church that is now past. And now the Holy Spirit doesn't do those things anymore. That's one way to do that. But, uh, there was a unique period in time in which the Holy Spirit was here, but now it's over. Um, my wife's tradition growing up had a little bit of that in... Uh, in their kind of conversation. Again, this isn't a like getting in, getting out kind of thing, but and also option two, I don't know if you can hear me when I'm not facing you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, so, well then I'm just going to teach the rest of the way just like this. <laughs> so the question becomes, like the fundamental questions becomes who's in and who's out, right? Because we're, have you punched your ticket? Are you going where we're going? In option three, which I think obviously is a more biblical way to look at things, it looks more like this. All right, so we still have something we might call earth or the universe, material world. We still have the reign of God, heaven, still places, except now we have these points of contact and interaction. So now we're talking about Jesus who is absolutely and utterly and completely divine and yet made of the same corporal stuff that we're made out of, heartbeats, lungs that breathe, gets hungry, gets tired. That's the Jesus we see in Scripture. Gets hungry, gets tired. Flips over tables, by the way. Makes a whip. <laughs> you know, one of my pet things is like Jesus meek and mild. Do you know Jesus meek and mild? My grandmother, <laughs> Lord love her and rest her soul. She's gone on to glory. She's in that great cloud of witnesses. Um, she had the painting that, uh, of Jesus who looked like he just got done surfing. You know, the one, he's super white. Uh, like blue, green eyes, you know, whatever. And there's like, he's got flowing locks, you know. <laughs> And he's like, kind of like, like he's never done a push-up in his life, and he's like, sort of like emaciated Jesus, but like super sweet looking, like you'd trust him, but like he's kind of weak. Jesus worked with his hands, and might have been, there's not a lot of wood, by the way, so carpenter might have been stone worker, uh, whatever it is, Jesus had some calluses and probably some shoulders, um, and was plenty tough, right? you know, first century Middle East didn't, I mean, and had been in the sun some, so probably didn't look like me. <laughs> right? I mean, just, I mean, I, you know, we, we get into pigment talk. I don't, we can't really nail that down, but I mean, probably wasn't a pale, freckled, green eyed dude like me. Uh, so, and I think Jesus loves me, but I don't think he looked like me. Um, so, uh, Jesus, meek and mild, Jesus has got some toughness there, and I think there's some fierceness there. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. And people always say, well, that, that's weak. Really? You ever been hit in the face before? I have. You know what my thought wasn't? Maybe I should let him do that again. <laughs> 
that was not my next thought. Uh, you know, that was not where my head went. But that's what Jesus says it should be. Here, do it again right here. And put some stank on it this time, you know? Uh, that is not at all what I think. That's tough. That is real tough. Okay, so here's Jesus, both. Uh, and then Scripture, right? So this is why we're talking about this with Luke's Gospel. Luke's a real guy with a real culture in a real ancient uh, context. And yet... I believe, we believe, that the Holy Spirit speaks in this in such a way that heaven talks through this text and speaks to us. Not flatly because the ink itself has fallen from heaven like it might in option two. There's a few places in scripture we're told that the word actually fell from heaven and was chiseled into stone. Like a couple. Like Moses, you know the stories up on the hill? Hanging out with God, chiseling him in. He has the three tablets. He drops the one. He said, 15, 10, 10 commandments. <laughs> oh, it's all Mel Brooks joke. Um, uh, right, but those are chiseled into stone. But really, most of the stuff we get um, aren't like that at all. We have scripture can sound really earthy. Right, you've read Paul, Galatians, we've talked about this. If you think circumcision will save you, keep on cutting. Whoa. <laughs> Galatians, and the English churches it up. The Greek is really, really explicit. I hope we're all to, I'm not going to go any further with that. I hope we're all together on what that might entail. Okay. Uh, that's Paul. Now, there's a real message behind that about if you put anything between people and the gospel, there's an intensity of response. But that's plenty earthy and culturally appropriate. Scripture is both. Uh, it makes sense of things like, so Moses is before the burning bush, right? Moses is out you know, hanging out with his livestock, because like any good hero of the Bible, he killed the dude earlier and then ran away. What happened? Yeah. Uh, right, well, in option two, all the biblical heroes are these kind of like flannel glass plastic perfection, aren't they? In the real scriptures, David? Let me tell you a little about David. King David, a man after God's own heart. David plots the death of a rival who he got his wife pregnant not to cover up his sin, he made sure Uriah went and died in battle. So if you haven't done that today, you're doing better than the king of Israel that they look back to. David had some struggles. Abraham, father Abraham, had many sons. Da, 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 da. Yeah, all that. Abraham tried to give his wife Sarah away twice. <laughs> How many women in this room are coming back the second time? <laughs> you might let one time slide. No one's coming back the second time. And it was to his own benefit and protection. He's like, yeah, that's my sister. That's what he said. Which was half true, by the way. The Bible's an interesting book. Um, it's half true. Uh, okay, so I'm just saying to say, that's okay, you know, because ordinary people made out of ordinary stuff that make big time mistakes are the place where the rain of heaven is poured out and things happen. It's good news for me. I'm guessing it's good news for you. Because my guess is you're made out of the same ordinary, broken stuff. And if God can use David and Abraham and those folks, then maybe, just maybe, he can use us. But oftentimes in option two, we got to preserve this sort of notion that these people are heroes and different than us. And not the same stuff. They really are. So Paul too, scripture. Okay, Jesus. Moses, he did, uh, maybe for good reason, but stepped into a fight, killed an Egyptian, runs away, gets married, uh, has some livestock. He's walking him around. This bush is burning. Uh, and he thinks, that's weird. It's not being burned. He keeps washing. It's still burning. He's like, I'm going to go check this out because college football hasn't started yet. And he says, I'm going to go check this out. So he walks over there, and then the bush says his name, right? Moses. What does it say next? Take off your shoes because the ground on which you walk is holy. All right. Moses, that ground, that dirt now, has been reclaimed uh, by heaven. Uh, the temple, the tabernacle, are built on the same notion. That dirt has now been reclaimed by heaven. If option one is contained, option two is escape, option three is invasion. This is about invasion. And it's in our very basic prayer, right? Jesus says when you pray, pray like this, right? Daily bread. Let's get daily bread. Forgive us our sins, right? May your will be done where? on earth as it already is in heaven, right? If you go to Revelation, you read the end of the book, I don't want to ruin it, but it's pretty good. Uh, when you get there, what you wind up with is hearing a story about how these things not only contact, but they become consumed together. Now, I still believe in hell, all right? But you know what hell is? Gehenna, and there's debates about this, but I believe it. Gehenna is the trash heap. It's the stuff that won't be redeemed in the great remaking of the world. The only people that go to hell, and I think people go, are the people who refuse to go anywhere else. They don't want what God's offering, and God's only option is to leave them be. And that's what hell is, the place where God lets you be.
Lewis's uh, work on this in The Great Divorce is pretty instructive. If you want to check that out, it, obviously it's a, a speculative thing, but I, I like it. Uh, so Jesus is still the way. So option two isn't wrong about that. It's just that the way doesn't go to escape. The way is invasion. And so when we paint a house on a mission trip, we build bridges, when we uh, do creative things, when we share with our neighbors, when we bless our children, we are doing this to be nice. We're doing this because that's what heaven looks like. When God's will is done in our life, this line moves around us. Prayer, which looks so strange in option two, is one foot here and one foot here and calling the power of this in this direction. That's what prayer is. Communion. It's just bread. We're about to have it. Bread. Uh, it's just uh, juice or, you know, uh, uh, fermented wine, grape. Fermented wine? That's ridiculously redundant. I apologize. You didn't need to hear that. <laughs> fermented grape juice or wine. You can't say both. Nancy, I'm just so sorry that I said that wrong. Will you forgive me? <laughs> You're leaving. <laughs> She's leaving. Awesome response. So uh, it's just wine, just grape juice, except we believe that the very body of Christ shows up in this. The very presence of forgiveness is in the cup. Uh, it's still those things. So uh, it didn't cease being bread or, or, or juice for us, and yet now it's also this, uh, this invasion of heaven. Um, yeah, questions on that? That's a lot. And then we're going to partake in this communion thing. So because of this, when we read scripture, we are doing, we're studying this, this special text that is this word from heaven. I do believe that. And it also contains real people with real cultures, uh, real struggles and real frustrations, both together in this place, which is good news for us because that's where we live. Uh, and now the Holy Spirit is the agent of that invasion. It is the, it is the reason that ground is holy or reclaimed. Um, yeah. Yeah. I put the marker down. You're done having to look at that. All right. Questions on that? Yes, ma'am. So, um, so sorry about this question. Um, Why are you sorry? If God is everywhere and omnipotent and omnipresent, then hell's not standing free on its own. God is somehow in charge and over that too, is it not? So your question is, if God is omnipresent and omnipowerful, <laughs> what do we do with hell as a place of God's dwelling? Or yeah. the angels. So, so somehow it's so I would say that God is present everywhere, but not equally present everywhere. So omnipresence doesn't mean, uh, for me at least, doesn't mean an equality of presence. And God is uh, present um, in some places uh, primarily in judgment. And here's the thing about hell and heaven in this one. You don't have to die to catch a glimpse of it. Or you don't have to go far from here. And some of you don't have to even, you have to go back in your memory. And remember, hell's not a place you go exclusively when you die. It's got powers and places it's claimed here. Maybe we can make some contact points over here. Uh, my drawing needs work, right? It's a, it's a metaphor. There are places and people that know this, right? Place where death reigns and, um, and it's just uh, corrosive and ugly and painful and horrible. Uh, you can feel it in some places. If you've been to places like Auschwitz or just places that just have been marked by evil this deep, you can sort of just almost feel it. In the same way, by the way, in a place that's been prayed in for a couple thousand years, it has an effect on that space too, at least in my perception. So uh, that's what I would say. I would say, yeah, maybe God's present there, but only in the sense of this is wrong, and I stand in judgment, this is not right. That's probably how I'd handle that. I mean, because I don't think God is equally, I mean, there's places in which God is uniquely present, and there's thin places where we become more aware of, of heaven. I do think, though, when, when this seems far away, it's because we've moved, not because God has, has distanced himself from us. That's a great question. I didn't apologize. I'm going to give you some Jesus points. You did great. Way to go, Lowry. Other questions? <clears throat> yes, sir? How does death figure into... Yeah, you're still going to die. I know that's what's not bad news for you. <laughs> yeah, you're still going to die. Not the worst thing that's going to happen to you. It's going to be okay. Uh, yeah, death still happens. Um, but death is one of those things, by the way, that winds up here in Revelation. Death itself. Death, sin, are invaders. This is hard for people who have been trained, for me too, because I have so trained an option too. Evil and death seem natural and normal and real. But biblically, they're invaders and corruptors. Good makes things. The origin of creation is goodness. Evil distorts goods. It twi doesn't make anything. It breaks and distorts. The most evil thing you can think of, and generally that's a person, is a distorted good or fallen angel, right? You're talking about the, the things that are really bad are goods that we're supposed to be. And think about all the things that wreck lives that are supposed to be great. 
right? Think of the best stuff. The best stuff in life. Food. We're killing ourselves with it. Sex. It's a pot. It was God's idea. It's all positive. I know we're all, we're all grown enough in here to say that, right? Right? But it, I mean, I have people in my office all the time who are heavily damaged by something that was supposed to be good. Either because they were subjected to a violent event or because we've, made, we've told them that bodies don't matter, so do whatever you want with your body. Except that they do matter. And we all kind of, in some place we find that out, some way or another. How we use our bodies matter. Um, so I think the best stuff, when it gets twisted, is really dangerous. Uh, and, that's, uh, and death is an invader in that way, and the ultimate promise is that death itself goes away. And so, maybe you're asking the ultimate, like, why would heaven now be attractive? Is that, is that a fair kind of segue for your question? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, all right. I like you. Uh, not just because you used to be on staff here, but I mean, you're, you're a good kid. I like you. It's good. Um, no, uh, yeah, so wh- why would I be more excited about this? All right, so if we go to... Either the beginning or the end, we see what God desires. We see people in community in abundance with food and his presence. I like food a lot. If I have a body, I can keep eating it. A resurrected body that doesn't worry about its BMI, that doesn't need a knee replacement, uh, that doesn't get corrupted. The promise is... um, is not an exemption from life. It's taking out of life the things that actually steal it. Like anxiety or distrust or the wounds that we have known that make relationships hard, that makes us not trust each other, that makes even the best relationships hard. Uh, And that friction that's there. Imagine life without that. Imagine the best meal you've ever had being only a hint of what food is supposed to be. Imagine the most beautiful thing you've ever seen, the sunset, the ocean, a a, a newborn baby, whatever it is that you imagine in your mind and think that's only a glimpse of the beauty we were built to see. Um, And, and maybe this isn't good news, there's work in heaven. So you're like, I already retired, I don't want to do it again. (laughs) There's work. Uh, like I try not to ruin the sermons in here, but it happens sometimes. So you can take Sunday off if you want. But work comes before the fall. Work is given in Genesis 2. The fall is Genesis 3. Right? Look, you, I'm, I'm a person who really at one point in my life thought the point of getting a job was to get one that paid enough so I could make enough money so that I could be really young when I stopped doing it. Think about how twisted that is. That's not abnormal, by the way, in this culture. How twisted is that? And and somebody this morning goes, well, you picked the wrong profession. I was like, I know. (laughs) I don't think this way anymore, most days. Um, Most days. Uh, We think in terms of work as a thing to avoid, because work itself is cursed. But it's the curse that corrupts, not work. Work comes before it, and we'll be there after it. There'll be gardens to tend. There'll be food to grow and bake. There'll be art to create. There'll be music. There'll be things to explore. Uh, all of which without the fear uh, that we're running out. Right? Uh, the curse of the garden is this. That by the f- uh, sweat of your uh, forehead you will eat. This again will come up in a sermon in a few weeks. Which is an ancient Near Eastern idiom, like knocking on wood. So we hear strenuous effort and we sweat. Okay, that's kind of true. What it really means is your daily bread will be anxiety. Outside the garden, the human condition is we believe there won't be enough. You sit in the richest country that has ever been. Ever. With technology advances that would seem like absolute magic to people who lived only 10 generations ago. We could right now, if we wanted to, wake up somebody in Europe just for fun. We could just call them. It's a random number in France. And be like, oh, we're just checking to see if our phone would do a magic trick and call France. In my pocket with no wires. I can tell you the weather in Beijing right now. I can tell you, but I already know, Kevin Bass struck out to end the Astros' run in 1986 at the hands of the Mets, who later beat the Red Sox. Anyway, no big deal, but just stuff that happened. We could go and we could watch it on my phone right now. It's amazing. We have more stuff and more things to do with the money that we have than any people who have ever lived. And we're abundantly happy. Ooh, y'all know better. We're abundantly happy. We're not. No, we're, we, every day we invent a new drug to feel better about all this stuff we got. I'm, and I'm, I got the stuff, I got my phone. I mean, I'm, I'm exempted from this. It's just the things that we think will deliver us don't because they've been touched as well. So the redemptive story, back to this, is uh, that what we have to do is see things in the light of this invasion, what it means for heaven's light to bear uh, on dirt itself, including us. So we ask questions like this in the church. What does it look like for God, get to, for God to get God's way? I mean, that's, what, that's what heaven means, for God to get away. So by the time we get to heaven, it won't be uh, 
a total surprise. We'll be working towards it all the time. Uh, and our bodies matter. Paul says pretty clearly that we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give account for the works done in our flesh. And you're thinking, well, I have to earn my way in. Not at all. It's just that what we do with our lives matters to God. It matters. Grace abounds. It's not about getting in or out. It's about how much heaven we can get poured into us so we can get it poured into the world. That's the good news uh, of the gospel and what I think Luke will unleash for us. Great questions. Jesus knew this would be a hard road. Uh, Jesus knew that death had reigned and needed to be defeated. Um, All that's true. And so he gathered his friends together in the upper room before he would be betrayed. And he broke bread, just simple bread, and said, take and eat. This is my body, broken and given for you. When that supper was over, he took a cup, filled it full and said, this is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it often and remember me. Let's pray. Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on this gift of bread and of cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in victory and the invasion is complete. Hope is restored. Wholeness is known. Joy is abundant. And life is healed. And so are we. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, uh, our Lord and Savior, uh, whose mission to invade the world with hope is ours today to carry forward until it is complete in you. All honor and glory yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to ask Wes to come up and play. Uh, Tracy knows how to do this. Tracy, will you come serve with me? She helps on the north side. Oh, look, there's Wes. This is Wes Taylor, everybody. Uh, we're going to take it by intention. There you go. That's right. He's a, he's a pro band guy. We're going to do it by intention, which means we're going to break a piece off, give it to you, tell you the truth. You dip it in the cup. Uh, if this is the first time to take intention, if you drop Jesus, i got good news for you. There is more Jesus for you. Do not dive looking for Jesus. We'll bring more Jesus to you by way of the bread. Everybody's welcome. It's not a university table. Uh, this is Jesus' table. We want you to be his guest. We believe that this is good food for body and soul. So come as you are so desire. Um, and then we are, we are in recess unless you have other questions tonight. We'll, I'll pray at the end when everybody's done if you want to hang, hang around for that. But if you need to go, uh, go ahead. Come on and come and taste and see the Lord is good. I was told to mention this as well, Ben. Uh, in the back by the kitchen area, there's a table of prayer cards. Yes. So as you take and go back, uh, you can go back here and fill them out and pray for them. Perfect. And yeah, books on the way out too if you need them. Yeah. The body of Christ is broken for you, Jim. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ was broken for you and for the world. Nancy, the body of Christ broken for you and for the world. Steve, the body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world, Lord. And the body of Christ is broken for you and for the world. Amen. Jen, the body of Christ is broken for you and for the world. Amen. The body of Christ is broken for you and for the world. Mike, the body of Christ is broken for you and for the world. Amen. And we won today. Oh, good. Won the series then. The body of Christ is broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ is broken for you and for the world. Amen. The body of Christ is broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ is broken for you and the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ was broken for you and for the world. The body of Christ was broken for you and for the world.
Was it on the whole? Oh. <laughs> that's not Megan's fault. That's my fault. Uh, yeah, I kept it off. And then I did mute it, and then I did. It's OK. Thanks, Megan. Um, God has fed us. Uh, and if you wonder where the demons live, it's in technology. We know this, right? We're fighting them all the time. Uh, we lay hands on the speakers and pray. Um, so this always leads to a conversations of intermediate states. So where is my beloved one who has now died? Um, I, be I believe actually the biblical word for that would be in paradise, right? You'll be together with me in paradise, which is a good place. Uh, it's better than here. But even the folks in paradise, Scripture says, look forward to the thing we're talking about here, which is the culmination of heaven and earth coming together like a bridegroom in Revelation and the restoration uh, of all of our hopes. That's when uh, the party really starts. Um, so it's, uh, I think there is a place for those duly departed to cheer us on, that great cloud of witnesses. But I think they're even looking forward uh, to the time in which uh, every tear has been cried uh, and now joy has filled the earth. Um, and all the ache and all the hurt and all the lies uh, are no more. Um, a great, I think it's a, a Lewis phrase. All that is uh, sinful and broken and wrong come untrue. I love that, right? They become untrue. They cease to be. That's the real healing that takes place. Um, well, uh, go forth from this place, uh, hungry to read chapters one and two. We won't do communion every time. It's just a, uh, the truth is I can't let y'all out early or I get in trouble with the students and the children's ministry. And so since y'all haven't read anything, we thought we'd do a little special thing tonight. We'll be uh, back at it in a week uh, and we'll jump into chapter one and do chapter two and, and read and learn together. Uh, any questions or comments before we go? I'll stick around a little bit um, before my own children have to be picked up. If I wait long enough, she'll put them down so we can uh, hang out today. Let, let's, let's pray and sin no more. Um, Lord, we, we thank you for laughter, for soul food, for your word, for your invitation. May we leave in courage that we are closer still to the moment when all the pain has been washed away. Make us agents of that hope this present hour that we so live, we so work, we so act, that heaven itself invades us and is shared with our neighbor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.